Um, uh, right. Um, welcome to my talk about live or atomic, uh, no, online or live atomic update. Um, I prefer the term live to online since online implies internet connection where live, where you could do a sneak it up update of a system and it would still be a live update if it didn't drop any services. Um, my goal of coming here to talk today is to get a bit of buy-in from the idea that we need to have both online updates and live updates working together and bounce a few ideas off people because I haven't got a complete solution yet. Uh, First, what do I mean by a live atomic update? Um, a live update means updating a system while it's running, so you don't have any service outage, so you serve your website, you don't get a connection failed because a request came in while you were updating the server. Pr atomic is a bit more difficult to explain. You might have heard of Project Atomic, OS Tree, things like that. Um, you go from one version of the installed system to the other in one go. So you either get entirely the old version or entirely the new version, and not all the intermediate states in between where you install this if file, remove this file, change this file partially so half of it's written and half of it isn't. Um, in tradition, this is generally done, but in atomic updates are generally done by restarting into the new version in my experience. Um, so you get an atomic update, but not a live one, since you have to take the entire system down and bring it up again. Um, traditional embedded projects do this with AB partitioning. So when you're running on partition A, you prepare partition B, instruct the bootloader to boot into B, and then reboot. So you're running B. There's a question, yes? I'll get to, I'll get, I'm getting to that at the end of this, this slide, so thank you for reminding me. Um, traditionally, you do this with e-partitioning, you prepare the second, reboot into that. You can also do a rescue and a current one where you reboot into a rescue partition and install into the current one. OS Tree and Project Atomic do this by rebooting into a different hard link tree using some very clever technology. Um, at my day job, I work on a project called Baserock for a company called Codepink. There's a few of us out in the audience. Um, this has its, ver has its versions of the software as different ButterFS subvolumes, and it reboots into each into a different ButterFS subvolume to do the atomic updates. Um, but the reason I've been investigating live atomic updates is because we don't want to have to reboot every time when we want to apply an update because we want to provide a web server and apply the updates without dropping any connections kind of thing. Um, we want atomic updates because it implies being able to do system image based versioning. So rather than having to work out exactly what's running on a system by looking at the entire package list, finding all the package versions in finding the version for each package and being ensuring that it's actually correct. You can look from the system image itself that this is version web server one or web server two and which helps in support because if you know someone's running web server one, you can know exactly what's going on there. Whereas if they were installing their own packages, they could end up with any combination thereof. We also want atomic updates because if you can't swap everything together at once, it's not reliable. If you lose power mid package update, then uh, you're in an inconsistent state where you could have anything going on and your system might not be bootable. There's tricks for ensuring that an individual file can be written atomically, so you don't see the in progress work where you've written the first half but the second half is still from the old file. But 
if you have interdependent files, such as, C such as shared object libraries, you need to find a safe order for replacing them. Um, for libc, the two support libraries that come with it depend on it, but they're versioned, and libc is generally good at backwards compatibility. So if you want to update these two, first you update this of a new one, and then these can be updated and safely use the new versions. And in the mid-state where you've updated this one but not these, they're still using the old version safely. But you need to declare this dependency somewhere for it to work, which adds a lot of packaging overhead. And if this internal ABI isn't correct, then you're still in the state of when you do the update and something goes wrong, you're stuck. I'm not even sure glibc is good about internal ABI differences since it declares a lot of symbols as glibc private. And it's obvious that if it's private, then nothing at all could possibly depend on, on them, so it's safe to change the ABI. Yeah. So, as any two files might need to be updated in lockstep for the system to be viable, we need some way of updating them all together. So, I've tried to come up with a way of doing an atomic file system update from the perspective of all the running processes. So, there's two steps of that. One, you make the, all the data available such that everything can use it, and two, you actually make the processes use the new version. In Base Rock, we have a copy and write file system, so if we want to update from factory to update one, we create a binary delta, and you apply it to that, and you get that. You then have to synchronize configuration, and all the actual state for users goes in there, but it's not so important. It gets mounted by the FS tab, and sorry about the mess. Uh, Graphviz was, my, was the most convenient tool. <laughs> so those all get mounted like that. The root file system is that, and that has the FS tab describing how to mount all these. So the result is you end up with a file system with these entries, but I've put underneath where on the actual file system they come from, because the bind mounts make this not clear. Not so obvious. Um, it's the mount root, which you can comes with ButterFS from specifying a different subvolume, but you can do it without doing that by mounting it somewhere else first and then bind mounting the subdirectory in. You can see this if you run findment or look at proc self mount info. Um, there isn't a way to remount a subvolume to use a different subvolume, if that makes sense. Uh, you can't change the you can't change what that points to by just remounting it. So, instead, I create a duplicate mount tree, which looks mostly the same as that, except there's a change to what we're mounting. And then I do a pivot route to swap these two around, which means that from the perspective of someone looking at this, you've now swapped what everything is. You do the same kind of transmission, uh, transition every boot when going from the init ramfs to your real root file system. Unfortunately, pivot root won't make all your existing processes use the new versions. It'll only change the calling processes root and current working directory. All your old processes are still pointing to the old versions. So while you logically swap these two around, all your processes haven't noticed. It's enough for early user space where you're running in the init ramfs since there's uh, very few processes running that you'd need to migrate. But we want to do it for everything. So my proof of concept uses the ugly, ugly hack of using ptrace to make this process chiroot, chadir, and reopen all these file descriptors. Yes, it's a very sick idea. <laughs> and it's not an appropriate solution since not all processes are p-traceable. Most processes aren't allowed to cheroot. <laughs> and they really don't like it when the actual, in, when the underlying file changes. 
for an example, journal D from system D, when it restarts, it keeps its existing state around in a, in a way such that it doesn't drop any connections by passing the file descriptors for each of the processes it's monitoring back to system D, writing out state to slash run to say which file descriptor was which, and then it, when it restarts, system D gives it those file descriptors back, and it reads from the state in slash run which one it was. It works out which one it was by the stdev and stino field from the file descriptor if you sap it, and if you do a reopen, those will have changed. So, ptrace is bad, don't. <laughs> I'm just about to show you how well it works. Uh, let's try and full screen that. This is a demo I recorded with the script command because I really didn't want to risk it not working. <laughs> uh, I specify how to replace the mount point. It runs. Fails to run first time because I forgot that to pivot root, you also need to have non private mount propagation. So there we go. It created the parallel mount tree back there. It's warning that all these processes aren't p traceable. So it's not working all of the way down to there, but then it's got to the end after moving a few and has pivoted into the new one. And so it's gone off the edge, but just demonstrated that the version of GCC has changed between the old version and the new version. <laughs> Don't applaud this, I'm gonna have to throw this all away. Because <laughs> it's doomed, because Ptrace is wrong. I could improve it slightly by using rename app2. It's a new system call, and you can exchange two directory entries atomically. So you can completely swap them around, so you have a symlink to the old version, and the real version to the new directory. They see the new one. It sounds perfect, but existing processes still have the old old root, even if you've changed the directory entry around. Uh, the reason for this is that processes refer to the file itself, not the path in the file system where it came from. So even if I were to use rename app to move everything around rather than the parallel mount tree I showed all the way back when, yeah, rather than this parallel mount tree idea, we'd still have to move all the processes and find an alternative to ptrace. Um, we could try to add a new kernel interface for changing a process's file descriptors, but I have my doubts that the upstream guys in the Linux kernel would accept this because it's awful, awful, awful. And it still has the stat of this file changing in between running, so you're still going to break journal D. Um, but I'm going to. But I've got a few ideas for things which might actually work. One would be file system transactions. There's been a few attempts to do something like this, and there's been at least two attempts to do it specifically for ButterFS. There's currently code in which lets you start a transaction and run some syscalls, and then when you end the transaction, all the changes have been applied atomically. Unfortunately, if you're not very, very careful, you'll deadlock your entire system. So, not useful. There, there was a patch as well to have a, a different way of doing a transaction where you provide a list of syscalls to run in the transaction, but that got rejected. And the suggestion was that instead you should have a way of merging two subvolumes. So you, so it's like a Git workflow. You branch, you make your changes, then merge back in. Um, another approach would be to fake an atomic update by freezing all your running processes. It doesn't matter if it takes longer to do each individual thing, if you can at least make it appear that it's all the same for everyone. Um, you can freeze a bunch of processes with a freezer C group. And to make sure that we've got something reliable all the way through, we freeze everything, create a snapshot, Instruct the bootloader to use that snapshot if all, all goes wrong. Apply the changes, 
And if it works, we tell the bootloader that, OK, you don't need to use that snapshot anymore. We're working with this one and unfreeze. So if your power goes out while updating, you've still got a viable system. And in between, no processes have seen something wrong. Um, yep. But for what, uh, if you freeze everything, you don't need a single operation to twiddle everything around. So rather than replacing which directory people would use, you keep the old directories around but change the contents like you were doing a normal package update, which works by removing the files but leaving the directory tree still standing. My goal is to have something which isn't a regression on installing packages on the system. And if you have your root changing and your file descriptor's wrong, then you're not doing that. Um, an alternative which gives, on the gives up on the idea of updating all the processes together anyway is that rather than trying to update every process to use the new version of the file system, we just swap up which version of the file system in it's using and have it restart all the processes in the new file system. This is not a completely terrible idea because you can make processes hand off their state to init and start again with the new state so you don't drop connections. But it doesn't work for SSH sessions because you'd need your SSH to be able to look down into all your processes and work out how it needs to restart them to get them to work properly. Uh, final approach would be to come up with a proxy file system that goes on top so your processes interact with that but you can have the proxy file system atomically swap which backing file system it should be using and it can proxy the inode numbers so they don't change in between. I'm a bit worried about this one um, since I'd very likely to just end up finding more things which don't work particularly and end, end up with a big pile of doom. AUFS, the layering file system, nearly fits the bill though because it does the inode remapping for you and you can add a new layer on top so new processes will see the new version of everything but you can't remove the old version from underneath while it's still got things open on it. So you could, yes, make everything new, use the new version but you won't be able to remove the old, old binaries from your system until you've effectively rebooted. Yep. After you've done the atomic update for every process, you still need to restart everything to make it use the new versions of the binaries, but you need to do that with package-based updates already. And cgroups would be a useful way to tell if processes are old, but for that, but you can look in proc self, uh, no, proc map to see which binary, uh, yeah, proc process ID maps to see which binaries still, which processes have old binaries still mapped in, so which ones are still running old code. And any other questions? So I really went through that, that quicker than I expected. <laughs> yes, at the back there. That is the plan. Yep. The point is. It's useful for you've connected in with an SSH session and you're running a shell and you want to re be able to still operate and see that the update has been applied at all. But yes, you would need to restart the new processes and Apache does have a way of doing that without dropping any connections. 
it's off a graceful restart, which is good. It'll have to be killed and restarted, yeah. It's an individual process restart, which is a lot more lightweight than doing the whole system, but yeah. And at the back? Okay. Um, I'm not sure I follow you. What's the question, but could I use LD preload to do the indirection so that processes get the new version? Um, I looked at whether you could use, um, I think the question was, uh, Nix does, Nix restarts processes by if the, when it changes the sim links for each of the package it is installed, it restarts any processes which were using things referred to the old path from the sim link, and whether that would, yeah, make things better. <laughs> Um, I looked at symbolic links for constructing the file system in a way which you could atomically update an individual or entry. Um, if processes are referring to files after following it, then they're still using that file and replacing the sim link means you have to replace everything. You have to restart the process. But, yeah. But the problem is if you have a big, long tree of things like you need to replace the entire root directory as one go. Whereas I want to have the entire file system updated t at once because there's different parts which interdepend on different versions, which I think Nix gets away with because each component refers to a specific version of a dependency. But I want to update everything so that the interdependent parts are updated in lockstep. Whereas with Nix, they replace a symbolic link and a and the default version of the binary get is changed to a new version. Um, am I out of time? Let's Another five minutes. Um, yes? Um, 
they're still using the old files, which is exactly what happens with package-based updates. Um, and he, I want them to use the new version, so if you... but it can gracefully restart in such a way that it doesn't drop any connections and it will eventually see the new version. I'm not sure I've got the point of your question, sorry. So, uh, uh, if you were to use the old system to start with, <coughs> you want to hand over the keys, uh, mm -hmm. the old stuff, so um, you would not be starting a totally new thing. The file, the underlying file is not going to change, right? So it's all like refreshing the start of the main thing. It's telling it that when it reopens, it's telling that it, it will use this new directory rather than any existing files itself. I didn't want to go as far as the open file descriptors for actual file content because uh, package-based updates sti already have that and that's beyond the scope of what I want to solve at this point. I don't want it to be worse than a package update. I want it to be better in the way that you don't get any intermediate states where this, it could reboot and the system be broken. It's, it also matters for how some processes gracefully restart. They might decide to re-exec rather than and ha how the systemd approach would work by you hand your descri file descriptors back and you restart. If you re-exec, you'll still have the old root directory, which is pointing to the wrong thing, and all your file descriptors pointing to the wrong thing. So if you just re-exec, you will get it. That's one of the things, and there's, there'll be probably others as I go to find them, but I haven't found all of the things which could go wrong. Any last questions? Great, thank you. Oh, one, one. Sorry, could you speak up? Um, I'm sure a lot of people want file system transactions, and if we can get them working, this would solve this. But all the approaches I've seen haven't gone anywhere, which is why it's in one of the future things to investigate to see if they can be done properly. Thank you for the question. Oh, one more. Could you move the old file system to a read-only snapshot and just keep them running for the time being? Um, yeah, we couldn't, and make the old version they're running read-only, so at least they're not doing any harm by still running, but we do want to migrate them to the new version. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for all coming. Steve, talk.